Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Retreat Hell Chapter 5 written by Lizzie Dragon. It was early. Radford lay on her back wishing she could go back to sleep and knowing that she wouldn't be able to. It wasn't the sound of orders, shouts or banter that could be heard around the camp that was keeping her up. Nor was it the sound of vehicles, construction, or aircraft rumbling overhead. She had grown up on military bases. These were familiar sounds to her. Neither was it the cot that she slept in. Somebody in the supply chain had thought ahead and all the troops that would be moving in and around the portal. Thousands of them, along with blankets and pillows, had been shipped in the stateside perimeter and in the chaos of the initial surge, they had been given a higher priority than some of the trucks carrying MREs and other rations. She had slept on far worse camping with family. Radford sighed, relenting to the inevitable, wiping the gunk out of her eyes. She pushed herself up to sit in her rack. The simple fact was that she was always, always, always had trouble staying asleep in a new places. Humvee on the move? Fine. Middle of nowhere? Fine. Rock for a pillow? Fine. Comfy rack in a new place? Not fine. She slept soundly enough, but if she slept anywhere unfamiliar, something in the back of her brain forced her to unrelenting wakefulness as soon as the sun was up, regardless of how late she actually went to sleep, and regardless of the time zone, regardless of the planet too, apparently. Twisting in her right, she grabbed the edge of her cart and pulled, twisting and popping the kinks out of her back. With pained but satisfied sigh, she released the cart and twisted to stretch the opposite direction. Doing so brought Rin into view, and she noticed that the Kishman was also awake, lying on his cart. She grabbed a far end of the cart with her left hand and pulled again, eliciting another painfully satisfying series of pops and a sigh of pained ecstasy of those who were too young to be too old for this crap. She also noticed that Rin was very pointedly turned to not look at her while she stretched, sending a million yard not looking, not looking stare straight through the canvas ahead. Releasing the cot again, she allowed herself a brief smile at his bashful modesty. It was refreshing compared to what she was used to dealing with, and utterly adorable, especially when you added his ears. Those tufts made him look like a long-nosed lynx or a caracal. They're so fuzzy. I want to, to, nope, no, 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 not thinking about it. Totally unprofessional, not appropriate. Trouble at sleeping too, she asked instead. Yeah, Rin said, pushing himself to sit up as well. His ears flicked as a halo rumbled over near distance. Strange noises, he added. The nose twitched. Strange smells. Are you saying that we stink, fox boy? Bradford couldn't pass up the opportunity for a jab. There was a reason why her initials had become her nickname. Yes, no, I, I mean, um... His ears flicked hard back against his skull, eyes going wide. Relax, she said, waving her hand to calm him down. I'm just poking fun. Besides, she waved a hand at her undershirt. We've all been sweating inside the same clothes and body armor for the last day and a half without even a field shower. War stinks, literally. Yeah, Rin snorted as Branford threw her blanket off and swung her feet over the rack, twisting and stretching a little more to work out the last kinks. I don't even remember the last time I felt clean. Speaking of getting clean, Branford pulled her pack out from under her cot and dug into a pack of baby wipes. Yeah. Try one of these, she said, pulling a wipe out and tossing the pack at him. He caught the pack after it bounced off his chest. What are these? he asked, giving them the same confused head tilt trademarked by the pit bull that she had as a kid. They're called baby wipes, she said, demonstrating their use by wiping her hands, then reaching up her sleeves and wiping her armpits. They were originally invented to clean babies, hence the name, but they were great for cleaning adults too. We use them for field showers. Eyeing the pack of wipes, Rin pulled off the blanket and swung his feet to the ground. Tugging a wipe free, he gave a sniff. With a wiggle of his ears and a shrug of his shoulders, he reached under his tunic and began cleaning himself. They're not perfect, but they help, Bradford continued, moving down to her feet to clean the grime of the cheese from between her toes. She would normally use a second wipe to clean under her breasts and between her legs, 
and didn't really give much of a frick about doing that in front of the rest of the squad. But that might be a bit too much for a little Kishman's sense of modesty today. That was when she noticed his feet. Dude, she said, pointing at the blisters and the patches of fur that had rubbed completely away. How do you walk? What? He said, looking down at his feet as he self-consciously pulled them away from her. Oh, he shrugged. The last pair of boots I could get didn't fit me well. The ones I have now fit me better. Radford looked at the boots in question. Bro, she said, giving the boots a firm knife hand. What are those? Standard pattern boots, Rin said as Bradford picked one up and inspected it. She could feel the sarcasm. The boots I was issued when I joined the Royal Host were good quality, but they're, um, not made as well as they used to. His ears dropped flat and waggled back forward and back a couple times before rolling back. She picked up the other one and compared the two. They don't even match. I know, Rin said there. I got them from, uh, someone who didn't need them anymore. I don't think they were originally a pair. Bradford glared at the offending footwear for a moment, dropping them back to the deck. Let me see your feet. What? Hold up your foot. Let me see. Okay. Run said, slowly lifting his foot up for her to inspect, one ear twitching towards her while he held her straight out to the side. Bradford shifted into a cot to sit directly opposite him and held out her own foot size. She pressed the two together, comparing the shape. He had pads on the heel and balls on his feet, and the short claw-like nails that reminded her of a dog's foot, though they were trimmed short, minus the pads and blisters and patches of bare skin. His foot was covered in the same ebony fur as the rest of his body. Nah, it seems close enough, she said. Playing footsies, jabs. Bradford and Rin both jumped, dropping their feet. Neither of them had noticed him approach. Shut the freck up, Kowalski. Hey, I'm not judging, Kowalski said, holding up his hands. Foot fetishes are pretty tame compared to some of the crap that I've played around with. What do you want, Kowalski? Just letting you know that I'm taking Goma and Stephens to collect the, um, um, equipment that we reallocated last night. We stuck them in some boxes and I had one of the guys in Foxtrot who owes me a favor launder them through the FOB overnight to avoid suspicion. Kowalski, you know how CO's guns often tells for a sergeant to not ask questions he doesn't want to know the answer to? Yeah, Kowalski said with a fun smile. That was the kind of answer I didn't want to know. Ah, right, Kowalski said. Well, anyway, I'm taking Goma and Scubba, Steve, to go dig in a latrine for me to scrap in. Very well. Bradford sighed as the lanky marine spun around and marched off, scrubbing an eyeball with her hand. Goma, Scubba Steve, grab your shovels. I need her to take my morning crap. Moving right along, she shook her head. Let's get dressed and get some chow. Then I'll take you to the platoon LT to meet Staff Sergeant Rickles and see if we can get you some pair of gear from supply. An hour later, they were walking out of the chow hall and Bradford had re-slinging her rifle over his shoulder. Normally, the whole squad would have eaten together but the rapidly expanding FOB was such chaos of activity that the cooks were constantly running a chow line for anyone coming through for food. Not that they were actually cooking anything yet. I've never seen anyone enjoy an MRE as much as you have, Bradford said, shaking her head at Rin. How can you not? He asked back. They have so much flavor. Compared to what? Old leather and hard tack. That sounds like standard fuel rations to me, except we're lucky to have old leather. Jesus, no wonder you guys are losing. Bradford held up a hand to stop Ren from walking into the street as a Humvee drove past, following up by a track hoe and a light dozer. Ren stared at all of them as they passed, his ears erect and pacing straight ahead. Didn't anyone teach you generals that an army marches on its stomach? Ha! Ren said, flattening his ears. That's a true statement. He shrugged as they continued. Food was never good, but it used to be better. The last couple years, though, he shook his head. Bradford was saved from coming up with a response by the arrival of the company headquarters tent. If by tent, you mean a pair of Humvees backed into each other with a camo netting strung between them. Bromley said to Lieutenant was in here. Bradford said to Run, appraising the arrangement with a shrug of his ears. She led the way around the front of the Humvee to the entrance side of the makeshift tent. Ah, Bradford, there you are. 
So, Bradford said, stepping under the snetting, Rin had her heels. This is second artificer Rinna Yat, the Granlin soldier that I was telling you about. She gestured at the lieutenant, sitting behind the folding table. Second artificer, this is our platoon leader, first Lieutenant Mayers. So, Rin said, snapping at her attention and giving the lieutenant a crisp bow. As you were, second artificer, we're still in a combat zone. Saluting or bowing is not required. Mayers was short for a marine, barely five foot seven. He was shorter than Rin, who was about five foot eight, if you didn't count his ears. At five, nine and a quarter, Bradford practically felt like a giant next to him while he was seated. As you say, sir, Rin acknowledged, relaxing his stance. But if I may ask, why is that a practice amongst marines? Snipers, Mayers replied. Rin tilted his head, his ears flicking at what Bradford recognized as the I'm confused but not sure if I can ask Waggle. Snipers are an infantry with a high-powered rifles and optics that can hit precise targets hundreds or thousands of meters away, she said, providing an additional explanation. Saluting officers paints them as a command targets to snipers who might be concealed in the area. That's why it's standard practice in modern Earth militaries to not salute in a combat zone. Same with rank tabs on helmets, she said, tapping her boonie. The Keeblers didn't demonstrate any capabilities that could compare, Mayer smiled, but I'd rather not be painted as a target in the off chance that they do. Ah, Rin said, his ears pricking back for a moment. I see. Those things are expressive. I bet money that he doesn't know how to feel about snipers being a thing, but I really need to figure out how to read his ears. Rin's ears flicked towards Bradford and then faced Mayer's. A sharp change of subject, sir, but uh, again, if I may ask, what is the significance of your rank compared to the Corporal Bradford's? His ears flicked to face down behind him. I mean, I gather that you're an officer and she is not, and that the difference is akin to the difference between a common armsman and a lord commander and a lord general's, but it is clearly not the same. The original historical distinction between an officer and an enlisted was pretty much the same in our world as it is on yours, Mayer said, with the enlisted ranks being comprised of common peasants and yeomen, and the officers being composed of landed nobility. Mayer shook his head. But that is not the case anymore. Most modern nations in our world don't even have hereditary nobility anymore, and most that do are strictly ceremonial. The United States of America was founded nearly two and a half centuries ago when the original thirteen British colonies in America declared our independence and revolted against the King George, Bradford added. You don't have any lords or nobility at all, no king. Not a one, and good riddance, Bradford confirmed with a nod. The practice of distinguishing officers from enlisted carried over from the older military traditions, Mayers continued, but instead of lineage or nobility, the distinction was set on education. Modern officers have had their bachelor's degree, either in graduating one of our military academies or earning the degree at another university and going through officer candidate school, or OCS. Mayers waved at Bramford. Education requirements are regular enlisted or minimal. You think you're cool because you can read, sir? Bradford glared at the lieutenant. Wren looked at her, his ears drooping in dismay. You can't read. I'm a marine, Bradford threw her chest back in pride. I eat crayons and drink glue. Don't let her fool you, second artificer, Mayers laughed. Bradford here is using her tuition assistance to get the degree in aerospace engineering. Don't you go starting any dirty rumors, sir. You see San Diego, right? Yes, sir. How far are you into your degree? About halfway, sir. What is, um, aerospace? Bradford laughed. That is, um, something that I'll explain later. Probably a good idea, Mayers chuckled. Anyway, did you discuss your proposal with Second Artificer? I did, sir. That is on board. One hundred percent. What about your chain of command, Second Artificer? What do you have to say about this? I don't have a chain of command anymore, sir. Ren kept his back rigid and his ears drooped. So far as I can tell, everyone else in my entire line has been wiped out. I see, Mayer said. Well then, he glanced around the table and picked up a folder. I have here a message authorizing the embeddedment of Ganlin artifices into my platoon. 
and another message relaying the authorization of the Gandan Supreme Commander himself. I don't think you have anyone higher than that who can override him. None but the king, sir. Very well. Welcome to 1st Platoon Echo Company. Mayers flipped the folder open and jotted down a few handwritten notes before signing a piece of paper. You are officially embedded in Bradford's squad and fall under her command. He flipped through the few pages in the folder, pulled out another sheet and signed it before handing it out to Bradford. He has the authorization to get him gear issued from supply. He glanced at Rin up and down. The mad scramble for the last few days had seen a lot of stuff shipped out that we really didn't need right away. But that the second artifice a year could be used. See that you get him properly equipped and get him into a uniform. Hi, sir. Speaking of uniform, Sergeant, Bayer said, picking up another folder off his shared makeshift desk. You're out of uniform. Say again, sir. What does he mean I'm out of a... What? You made the cut this month, he said, handing her an embossed folder. It's a little late, actually. It would have been awarded two days ago, but, um, well... He waved around them. Congratulations. Rin's ears perked up, but he stayed quiet. Uh, thank you, sir. Bradford opened up the folder to reveal a certificate of promotion, dated for the 12th of June. You've been eligible for sergeant for, what, at least two quarters? Yes, sir, Bradford said, glancing over the certificate, running the time-honored words through her mind. How long have you been in now, sergeant? I, um... She glanced at her watch out of habit, not actually reading the date. Three years and four months on the first, sir. Not bad, sergeant. Keep up the good work, he said, offering her a hand, and she shook it. Thank you, sir. That'll do for the ceremony, he said, handing her a small stack of folders. Same with these. Sir, promotions for the rest of your squad, sergeant. You're not the only one who made the cut this month. Understand, sir. Then there, your squad sergeant, the docks at the UC San Diego were able to save his leg. Gutierrez is going to be convalescent for a long while. That leaves you. The good news is that you're getting Kimber back. Doc stitched him up. Said he's good to go so long as he's careful about the stitches on his arm. Well, there was his left arm, and that was it. He should be fine. Right, Maya chuckled. Bad news, sir. There is always bad news. Davies is back from the convalescence, Mayor deadpanned. Freck, she grimaced. Are you sure that you can't dump him on another squad, sir? No can do, Sergeant. There's a war on. We need every Marine that we can get, and your squad's taken three losses as it is. I know you don't want to have to deal with him, but he's your problem now. Maybe you can figure something out with a Gutierrez, couldn't? Aye, sir, Radford said with a heavy sigh. Is there anything else, sir? Just see the correct your uniform while you're at supply. Will do, sir. Very well. Sorry to rain in your parade, Sergeant. Dismissed. Hi, sir. Bradford braced in attention and turned to depart, nodding her head at Rin to follow. Outside the tent, Bradford turned left and started marching down the street. Come on, supplies this way. Congratulations, Rin said, struggling to keep up without breaking into a jog. Yeah, thanks, Bradford said, glancing down at the first folder in the stack that she was carrying. Who is this Davies? Rin frowned, Rose's right ear swiveling on alert, but his left ear was locked solid with her. Why does him coming back make you so angry? I'm not angry, Bradford growled. Rin flicked a tail against her elbow. You humans can be hard to read, but you're not that hard to read. Frick, is it that obvious? Yes, Bradford sighed. Davies is a blue falcon. Rin gave her his, you're using words I don't understand, sighed I. It's a code word for buddy, Frecker. He's a holier-than-thou prick who thinks the crap doesn't stink. He'll undercut and double-cross you, snitch on anyone he catches breaking regs. He thinks he can get away with bending the rules, and he spends more time broke prick than any actually being useful. Bradford found herself knife-handling in the air in front of her, and decided she needed to rein in a little. We also go way back. We went to infantry school together, reported on the same day, and have been assigned together ever since. He's been a prick for as long as I've known him, but he thinks we've got some kind of special friendship because we've known each other for so long. She checked her rising knife hand and clenched her fist instead. 
The lazy bastard even managed to make corporal the same month I did. But now you outrank him. Brun raised his eyebrows at her, the tips of his ears flicking in towards each other. Yeah, now I'm his sergeant, and I own his rear, she growled, and he'll probably try to frick me over somehow. Because of that, she glanced at Rin. I'm not sure how he'll take to you, but watch out for him. He'll come at you with smiles and friendship, buddy-buddy-like, but it's all for show. There isn't anyone who's known him more than a couple weeks who hasn't been fricked over by him. I'll keep that in mind, Rin said, rolling his ears. On a happier note, we're here. She gave him an ironic smile. Let's go shopping. She flipped open the door flap of a long beige tent and led the way inside. Morning, Jackson, she said as the corporal standing at the folding table inside the door, sorting through what looked like stacks of receipt forms. Crates, boxes, and bags were stacked on top of each other, and all temporary shelving in several neat rows through the tent. On the far end, a section of the wall had been rolled up and the marines had formed a daisy chain, offloading more crates and boxes from the back of the truck. Morning, Jabs, he said without looking up. What can I do for you? He absently scratched at his moustache with one hand as he sorted the papers into neat stacks. Got a sign slip from the LT. Need to outfit an embedded foreign asset. She handed him the sheet of paper and Mayers had signed earlier. What, did the Brits send some intel weenie or something? Oh, crap, he said, finally looking up and seeing Rin as he took the paper. Corporal Jackson, this is second artificer, Ayat. Ayat, this is Corporal Jackson, one of the H&S Company pogs. What's a pog? Rin asked as Jackson rolled his eyes. Person other than Grunt, Bradford explained with a smile. He sits back here, shuffling papers and counting beans, while the infantry tribes actually go to war. Ah, Rin said with a nod. We have those too. Yeah, and if it weren't for our supply types, you'd be out here fighting naked, chucking rocks. He absently waved away her insult as he skimmed over the paper. Jabs, do you know how many stars have signed this piece of paper? Not a clue. You'd have to take up both of your boots to count that high. He shook his head, stepping over to a copy machine set into the stack of crates. Freck you, Bradford laughed. Our supply situation's all freckered up right now, he said as he ran off a copy of the paper. Rin's ears flipped straight up, focusing on the copier. The sheet of paper hit spat out. Jackson performed some secret supply ritual of signatures and stamps and handed Bradford back the original. We've got a thousand things we don't need, and half the things we do, and half of those things are still at the main supply depot at Tolkien. God, it's hard to take that name seriously, he muttered, shaking his head. Captain Holbrook's actually back at Tolkien right now, trying to find the heads to bank together to get this mint sorted. And in the meantime, they keep sending us random crap as it comes through the portal. He waved at the truck being offloaded at the other end of the tent. But, he continued, we've got plenty of the stuff you're looking for. He shook his head. We're about to go down to one meal per day because they're not sending enough food to feed the bodies and pouring in here. But we've got plenty of combat uniforms, boots, plate carriers, rucksacks, and other basic kit that everyone already has. But that you'll all be looking for. Excellent, Bradford said, holding up a stack of folders. I'll need some new rank pins. Oh. Bradford showed him the contents of the forger. Oh, damn, Jabs, congratulations. He shook his head. Man, I remember when you first showed up in the battalion. Now you're making me feel inadequate. You are inadequate, Jabs smiled with a wink. Oh, frack off. Jackson laughed. Most of the crap you'll need is at least three rows down. Down there. He waved in the corner of the tent. Let me know when you find everything so I can track it properly. Will do. Thanks, Jackson, Bradford waved at Rin, and they made their way around the ordered rows of the corner Jackson had indicated. Bradford scanned the marked crates and boxes and looked Rin up and down. All right, let's see, let's start with the uniform. She waved at the gambesome and started rummaging around the boxes. Go ahead and start getting that stuff off. Um, you can go around the corner to try stuff on, Bradford laughed. I won't peek, I promise. With a sigh and resigned to flick of his tail, Rin began undoing his gambesome. 
Bradford opened up a box and pulled out a blouse. Jesus freaking Christ, I don't think they made these uniforms for wide bodies this big. She held it up to Rin to see. We could both wear this at the same time. Rin's ears went straight up, an expression of concern on his face. How big do humans get? Not big, fat, Bradford said, stuffing the brows back into the box they came from with disgust. What people do to their bodies in the civilian world is their own goddamn business, but anyone that's grossly out of fitness rigs shouldn't even be fricking me in the corpse. Sounds like some Lord Commanders I've seen, Rin grumbled, folding his gambesim and setting it on the desk. Bradford pulled out another box. Aha! This one should be more your size. She pulled out another blouse and held it up for inspection, then tossed it at Rin. Here, try that on. He managed to catch it before it engulfed his face. He held it up for inspection, gave it a sniff, and with a waggle of his ears he set it down so that he could strip off his tunic. It was grey and yellowed, but Bradford suspected it had originally been white. I wonder how long it's been since he had a new, clean clothes. Picking through the boxes, Bradford glanced at Rin and had peeled off the tunic. I guess that fur doesn't really leave much to see. His coat wasn't shaggy by any means, but it was just long enough to have a little bit of fluff. Like a short-haired cat, I wonder if he sheds. His chest and his bit deeper than it would have expected for a human. His neck and shoulder proportions were a little different, but overall his frame was close enough for that of a human. I guess walking upright leads to some common patterns. While Rin figured out the buttons on the blouse and donned it, Bradford pulled out a pair of pants and a pack of undershirts, and suppressing an unprofessional giggle, a pack of skibbies. How do I look? Rin asked, holding his arms out. Bradford turned his head to give him an appraising glance. Well, the sleeves are a bit more loose than normal, but they're designed to be baggy, so it's fine. It's not too tight around the shoulders. Oh, it's fine, Rin said, rolling his shoulders as he inspected the blouse. He pulled open one of the front pockets, and his ears perked up at the tearing of the rip of the Velcro. What is this? he asked, closing it and reopening the pocket several times. Bradford laughed. That's Velcro. It's great for sticking things, but makes a lot of noise. Yeah, try these on. She dumped a load of clothes in his arms. Rin took the items, examining them while shifted them to a better grip. What are these? he asked, holding up a pick of skivvies. Those are skivvies. They're for under your pants, assuming Kishman and human bodies keep the same stuff between your legs, she said, and his orange eyes lit up as the humor before it went wide as his ears flicked back. She chuckled, certain that he'd be beat red if you were a human. Go freaking change, fox boy, and let me know if anything doesn't fit. He looked at her, his ears flicking out. You do that on purpose, don't you? I disavow all knowledge of what you're talking about. She gave him a perfectly innocent smile. You are the most crude woman that I've ever met, he said, walking around the stack of crates in the next aisle. Have you met many women? I'm done with this conversation. Bradford laughed and began sorting through the stacks of supplies, looking for the things Rin would need, and anything else useful that I might be able to sneak out of here. Oh, hey! She pulled out a pack of baby wipes out of the cargo pocket and chucked it over the dividing row of crates and shelvings. They haven't gotten showers set up yet, so while you're stripping down over there, clear yourself up a bit. Ah! He shouted after she heard a pack bounce off something and smiled. What is it with you people and throwing things? Bradford laughed and continued building a pile. A few minutes later, Rin stepped around the corner again. What do you think? He struck a pose, putting his hands on his hip. Well, damn, Rin, if those horns and that face, you really do look like a devil dog. Bradford laughed. Looks good. Everything fit all right. What's a devil dog? Rin asked as he walked over to set his old clothes next to his gambesome. Nickname for a marine comes from the First World War. The Germans called the U.S. Marines they fought against Eiffelhunden, which roughly translates to devil dog, and the nickname stuck. I see, Rin nodded, but what's a dog? Bradford paused, leaning against the crate as she lifted her head at him. Dogs are a companion species, we call them man's best friend, and our civilization wouldn't exist without them. She paused. I'm pretty sure that they brought the canine unit last night. We'll swing by the kennels after we're done here, and I'll show you. Sounds good, Rin said, poking at the pile of gear Bradford had collected. 
What's all this? This, Radford said, is your kit. You've got your backpack and all the accessory packs to put everything in. She pointed at each item. Your mess kit, hydration pouch, wooby and sleeping system, ballistic glasses. Bradford paused. Not sure if those will fit you, but you can try them on. She shrugged. Top, IFAC, gloves, glove liners. She waggled her fingers at him. Good thing they would both have five fingers. Neck gaiter, shovel, mag pouches, Batman belt, frog gear, drop pouches, grenade pouches, knee and elbow pads, canteens, waterproofing pouches, Gore-Tex pants and jacket, more pouches, extra socks and skivvies, plate carrier, isapi plates, and uh, Kevlar helmet, she added, plunking down said helmet on top of Rin's head. It promptly snagged on his horns, keeping the helmet from actually sitting on his head, and doing a very little good. You carry all of these, he are shoving her hands away and pulling the helmet off his head. His horns snagged and the strapping, and it took him a moment to remove it. He handed it back to Jabs in distaste. This is what a basic loadout. We also carry ammo, grenades, batteries, battery charger, night vision goggles, radios, and other personal gear. How much does this all weigh? With a weapon and full combat load of ammo. About a hundred pounds or more, Bradford shrugged. These guys in Weapon Company can lug about a lot more hauling mortar rounds, rockets, and bouts of ammo. Rin looked back at the pile of gear with a sigh. And I thought my marching pack was heavy. Don't worry, I've got something that'll cheer you up, Bradford said, holding something behind her back. Oh, Rin's ears perked up a little. What's that? Boots, Bradford said, pulling out a pair from behind her back. Yeah, put some socks on and try these on. Rin's ears perked up, and he promptly sat down. It took him a moment to figure out how to put on socks, but once the problem was solved, Bradford handed him a boot. I'm not sure if the size is right, but it should be close. I've got three other sizes here for you to try on, if it doesn't fit right. What miracles you weave, Rin muttered. Hmm? Bradford asked. It's from an old fable, Rin explained, as he tried on the different boots. About a young woman who tricks a coral elder to telling them that the secret wisdom, and uses it to create miracles with her mother's loom. Yeah, sounds pretty awesome. Doesn't end well, he frowned. The coral didn't tell her all of the secret wisdom, and she learns the hard way that everything comes with a price. Oh, it's one of those stories, Bradford snorted, poking around some more boxes. He shrugged. I always felt the ending was off, contrived, like it was originally something else that was somebody rewrote the end differently after the fact. Figures, she rolled her eyes. So, are the coral like some ancient mystical cult or something? She waggled her fingers at him. Rin laughed. No, they're the coal. They're, well, we sometimes call them the rock people because they look like rocks when they huddle up and hold still. You mean there is another species like the elves? Bradford wandered round the next aisle over and continued her snooping. Well, they're definitely not elves, but yes. What are they like? Nobody really knows, Rin shrugged. The coal are even more reclusive than the elves used to be. They are a mountain people, and they live in small tribes, he snorted. They profess great wisdom, but refuse to share any of it with the outsiders. He waggled his ears. They have no regard for national borders and have little military or economic significance. They are considered a minor annoyance, but no threat, and not worth the effort to remove from terrain that is rarely inhabited by any of the nations who claim the mountains they live in. Do you know where they come from? Bradford poked her head back around the corner of the aisle. Not a clue, Rin replied, tugging on another boot. Some legends say they formed out of the bones of the mountains themselves, and are the guardians of all the ancient wisdom of Gala itself. He rolled his ears and shrugged. Personally, I think they're just stories. Glancing over his shoulder, Bradford walked back into the aisle and slipped a couple boxes into Rin's sack of old clothes and armor. She held up a finger to her lips in a shushing motion. Rin mimicked the motion, his ears tilting forward in confusion, then understanding drawn across his face, and he flicked his ears in amusement. Are there any other species or nations on this world? Do you guys have any other allies? Well, there used to be other Kishman nations and city-states. Most of them were unified under the Ganlan banner three generations ago. The rest either joined the kingdom during the war, or had been wiped out by the elves. 
He pulled on the latest boot off and sat comparing the other one for a moment. I think this pair fits the best, he said, holding up the other boot. Great, Radford said, taking the other boot. Let's just put these other boots back in their boxes and gather the rest of the stuff up. I just have to throw it all on, but the bean counter's got to count the beans. She waved at him and started putting the chosen pair back in the box. Go ahead and put those ones on. Right, Ridden said, happily stuffing his feet into the boots. They're also dull gras. They have a number of disparate city-states that are constantly shifting alliances, all orbiting their central kingdom. They're big, slow creatures, broad of body and narrow of hips, and they walk with knuckles as much as they do feet. He paused, staring at his booted feet, and Bradford laughed when she realized that he didn't know how to tie them. Yeah, let me show you, she said, pointing out the proper military way to lace his boots, and how to tie them. They're brand new, so it'll probably gonna suck for a while until they get broken in. But the more you wear them, the faster that happens. Just make sure you take them off and let your feet air out whenever you can. Don't know about you guys, but foot fungus infections can cripple a marine. I'll keep that in mind, Ren said as he started gathering up his things, new and old. Radford put a few things back on the shelves or on other boxes and gathered an armful himself. Are the Dolgra your allies at all? How are their relations with the elves? The Dolgra were always a decent trading partners, even if we did have to dance through the games of intrigue. But the elves are between us and them. They cut off the only land access we had to them years ago, and along with most of the sea trade. He shrugged his ears. I did hear a courier ship manage to slip the Elven barricade during the storm a few months ago. The word it brought was that the Dalgra were not so engaging with the elves and were seeing more success in their defense, mostly thanks to the mountain rangers that marked the border between their territories and the Elven territories. All right, Jackson, I think we got everything, Bradford said as they approached the exit. Set it all out here, he said, clearing out some papers from his table and pulling out a handheld scanner. The system actually working, Jackson. It works great when it actually works, Jackson replied. And it turns out, when you're only a three-hour Huey flight from Silicon Valley, it's surprisingly easy to get some egghead type who actually knows what the frick they're doing on scene to properly set it up. Hoorah, Bradford said. As Jackson began scanning the barcodes, she turned back to Run. So the Earls are fighting a two-front war, and we're still rolling up the opposition. Yeah, Rin sighed. Magic is so much easier for them. Every elf can do magic. They usually specialize as a mage or a gem blade or a hundred other specialties. But every elf can do some very basic sparcraft and enchantments. And everything they do, every tool, every weapon, is enchanted by it. Sounds like a tough advantage to beat, Radford frowned. Is it what you and the Dolgra, or is it anyone else? There is the Kalim Kali, across the ocean to the east. They are cousins to us, he said, flicking his ears out horizontally and then back to the normal 45 degree swivel. Though distant enough that interbreeding is rarely successful, he shrugged. There are rumors of a land bridge between our continents to the north, beyond Alban territory. But the only contact we have had with them has been by ship, with the owls blocking the seas. We have no communications with the Kalim Kali for years. Sounds like the elves have been working hard to keep you all cut off from each other, Jackson said. Divide and conquer, Bradford added with a nod, shoving gear into Rin's backpack as it was scanned. Well, we're on the job now. The U.S. will kick their rears all the way back to whatever hippie tree-hugging hellhole that they crawled out from, and the Marine Corps will lead the way. Hoorah, Bradford agreed. She picked up the stack of Isapi plates and Jackson finished scanning them and stuffed them into Rin's plate carrier. You're all set, Sergeant, and there's those rank pins for you, on the house. Thanks, Jackson. I'll make sure that Kowalski gets you a souvenir. Appreciate it, Jabs. You need anything else? Mm, crap, yeah. She stopped mid-turn, suddenly thinking of something. Name tapes and a name patch for a yacht. Sure, he said, pulling out a pen and a notepad out of front pocket. How do you spell it? Um, Bradford turned to Rin. How do you spell your name? En height ye untart, Run replied without hesitation. Frick, how do we just do that with harmonic spelling in English? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea, Bradford said, and she looked at Run. 
Any chance you could do the written language translation spell? Nope, not my specialty. Ren shook his head, tugging on the staff that he'd slung over his shoulder. Honestly, spells like that are hard. Right, so Rin, shields, a yacht, Bradford told Jackson, R-I-N, shields, and A-H-Y-A-T. So, just the one end for Rin. No, it's a hard nigh, not a soft nah. I am not a fish, Rin flicked his ears back. Wait, Rin sounds like fish. Not if you say it right, Bradford laughed. Let's go with two ends, then, and I don't let Kowalski know. You'll never hear the end of it. Two ends it is, Jackson said. Should be able to have these ready for you in a couple days. Or three weeks, he shrugged. Anything else? I think we're good for now, Bradford said. Thanks again, Jackson. Any time, see you round, Jabs. Later, Bradford grabbed Rin's rucksack and threw it over his shoulder, and then handed him his plate carrier. Here, you can carry this. We'll get it adjusted back at the tent. Rin took the fully assembled plate carrier and nearly dropped it. Tja! What's in this thing? Rocks! Close to it, Bradford laughed, heading out to the supply tent. But the damn things work. Gomez took a hit from one of those elf wizard sticks and suffered nothing more than a bruised ego. And there are a few guys in the battalion who took AK rounds in Iraq and Afghanistan who got back up because of those plates. I guess it's better than a full plate armor our knights and dragoons used to wear, he said, following her across the FOB. And it actually works against the shard blasts. That's the spirit, Bradford said, leading the way across the FOB. Hey, isn't the pavilion back that way? Yeah, but the kennels are over this way. I told you I'd show you some dogs on the way back. You mean we're going to haul the stuff all over the camp? Yep, when we get out of the field. You're gonna haul all of the stuff all over the countryside. Rin whined and readjusted his grip on his plate carrier and old garments. I think you should have just borne that old stuff, by the way, Bradford commented. I don't think it's going to be worth saving. Yeah, Rin said with a sigh. You're probably right. And here's the kennel, Bradford said, stepping over the small, caged-in yard. An obstacle course was set up inside, and the marine was following a big German shepherd around as it exercised through the course. That's a dog. Rin stepped up to the chain link fence and tilted his head. His ears flicked forward as he watched the dog. I, uh, can see the resemblance, he said. They're a descendant from wolves, pack hunting predators, Bradford smiled, recalling fond memories of the dog she grew up with. A couple hundred thousand years ago, or so, back when we were still the tribal hunter gatherers, some of them started hanging out around our settlements, or camps, or whatever the freck they had back then and we kind of adopted them. The combination of evolution and selective breeding for different purposes. Plus a couple hundred thousand years, and you've got dogs. So, they're domesticated livestock. No, they're a companion species. They're not people smart, but they're very intelligent creatures, and they usually form social pack bonds with whomever they live with. She shrugs. There are a lot of working dog breeds, but it's more of a partnership with them putting their weight in our civilization, though it's not an equal partnership. I see. Rin watched the dog as its handler for a long moment. Is that how you view us? Bradford frowned, pulling her boony cap off and ran her hand through her hair before responding. Full disclosure, there are a few jerks out there who will. Freck, we're still stamping out the last dregs of freckwads who think that it was about humans. She put her cap back on. But if most people... Most people are decent, if given a chance. You're obviously as intelligent as we are, just a few centuries behind us in technology. She shook her head. I can't promise that there won't be humans who try to take advantage of your people because of that, but I can promise you that I'll fight anyone who tries. Fair enough, Rin said, and they turned to Voy from the kennels, heading back to the squad pavilion. Some of my people will probably try to do the same. <laughs> Sounds like we'll be perfect for each other then. Jabs! Shields! Look who's back and not dead! Yeah, I heard Gomez, Bradford said, walking through the pavilion to drop Rin's new pack on his cot. Welcome back, Kimber. How's the arm? Fine. Doc stitched it up nice and tight, he said, waving from across the pavilion. I'm combat effective and ready to kick some Keebler rear. Since when are you a sergeant, Jabs? Dora asked. Oh, snap! Two days ago, apparently. Jab said, holding up a folder and tossing out a rack. 
I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news on Gucci, too. Yeah? How's he doing? Edison asked. Doc's managed to save his leg, and he'll be able to walk on it again with rehab. Frick yeah. Man, can you imagine Gucci trying to dance around on a peg leg? Asked Samson. Probably would have made him better, Kimber laughed. True that. What's the bad news, Jabs? Asked Kowalski. The bad news is that he's on rehab indefinitely. Might even be on his way at the Metsep. She tapped a few ranked pins on her chest. I'm officially the squad leader, so I'm in charge of all you fricks now. Crap, that's the bad news, Edison asked. Fricking a bra. There's worse news too. The Keeblers wussied out and aren't going to forgive us a fight, Kowalski asked. No such luck. Davies was cleared by medical. He's coming back from convalescence. Frick, I thought he was tapping out on some psych bull crap. Apparently not, Bradford shook her head. But I do have some other good news, she added, holding up the folders, gaining everyone's attention. It's not much for a ceremony, but some of you fricks managed to make the cut this month. She flipped open the first folder. Samson, you made corporal. Sweet. Miller, you made Lance corporal. Nice. He responded with a slight smile and a nod. Gomez, you made PFC. What? I don't meet the timing grade for another two weeks. Don't freaking question it, Goma. It just takes a goddamn paycheck. Kowalski said, smacking the back of his head. Ah, freck off. And finally, Kowalski, Bradford shook her head, handing him a folder. You made corporal. Again. Freck. Probably the only man in the corpse is angry about making rank. Right there. Dubois laughed, pointing at Kowalski. Kowalski responded by flipping him the bird. Congrats, everyone. You all earned it. Now let's get all this gear squared away and get some chow before they put us down one meal a day. What? We're in a freaking FOB. There's a freaking McDonald's less than 25 kilometers that way. Edison pointed towards the portal. And they're putting us in one meal a day. Not yet, but the supplier situation is wrecked. Bradford shook her head. They keep sending us all the crap we don't need and half the crap we do need. We've got enough food for the marines that we've got yet now but they're sending bodies in faster than they're sending the food to feed them. Now stow your crap. And Kowalski, if that espresso maker blows up inside the tent, I'm not lying to the CO to cover your rear. Aye, Sergeant, Kowalski said, snapping to attention and giving her officer a doofy salute. Bradford rolled her eyes and turned away from the rest of the squad, starting putting the gear away. She paused mid-turn. Dubois, where the frick did you get an avocado? I got a whole bag of them, he beamed. They're not ripe yet, but they're fresh picked. Snagged them off of a pile of trees they cleared out from around the portal. Figured it'd be shame to see them go to waste. Fricking millennials, Krawalski rolled his eyes. Hey, I'm older than you, you frick. No fresh avocado snack bread for you. Rin shook his head as he arranged his own gear, his ears flicking in amusement. You keep using that word. I don't think it's translating right. What does it mean? What word? Bradford asked. Frick, he asked, struggling to pronounce the F sound right. Frick means, um, a lot of things, Bradford glanced around awkwardly. Yeah, I keep getting a lot of different meanings whenever you say it. It means all of them, depending on context, Addison added. Oh, all the magic and you can't translate Frick, Kowalski asked. He waved his hand in his air. Can't you just snap your fingers and conjure up an understanding? Magic doesn't work that way, Rin said, shaking his head. Well, why the frick not? Um, Rin's tail twitched, and he tugged his left horn. You have to create an artifice to manner to do anything with it. The more complex the thing is, the more refined or precise or delicate you need to be. The more mana you need to control the thing that you're using to do the thing. He shook his head, his ears flicking agitated while he gestured in front of him. On top of that, you have to know how to structure the artifice to do what you want, and translating language from raw mental concepts is very complex, never mind implanting that understanding in your head. So how did the mass translation spell you guys put on work? Edison asked. The artificer who did that was the Supreme Commander's personal aide. He's a goddamn savant, one of the greatest artificers that has ever lived. He burst a mana crystal large enough to power one of our heaviest artillery pieces for a week, straight with his bare hands, 
and the effort nearly killed him. Well, crap, Miller said into the silence that followed. So, um, he can't match me up a Starbucks. Shut the frick up, Skowalski. Mid-afternoon found Bradford cleaning her rifle, showing Rin how it worked. That's amazingly crude and incredibly sophisticated at the same time, Rin said, examining the bolt carrier. Yep, Bradford laughed, and she nodded at his magic stick. How does your magic staff thing work? It's on articulation staff, or just a staff. Rin picked the staff up from the rack to show her. It was a little longer than her rifle, and mostly straight, but with a slight curve at the bottom end. It's constructed to facilitate the flow and manipulation of mana. Artificers are Kishmen who have natural ability to sense and manipulate ethereal mana on our own, though only to a limited degree. If we can get a source of concentrated mana, like mana crystals, we can do more, but manipulating energy with raw mana crystals can be difficult, and sometimes extremely dangerous, especially if you don't want to burst the crystal and use it all at once. He waggled the staff. That's where these come in. With the light materials and designs, we've been able to create tools that facilitate and regulate the use and modulation of mana, at least for a certain range of actions. He set the staff on his lap, tracing the lines of the precious metals set inside the length. The standard artificer staff is designed to facilitate a generation and conventional spell shots, personal and line shields, and an assortment of standard functions, like disrupting the artifice structures of Alvin spells, particularly their true invisibility spells. Cool, Bradford said, taking the staff when it was offered to her, holding it up to examine it. You've mentioned artillery pieces before. I'm assuming you have bigger staffs that shoot more powerful spells. Essentially, yes, though the construction of more powerful articulates like that requires them to be more focused and specialized. We can also create single-use articulators embedded in small mana crystals for use as ammunition and more conventional artillery. So you guys might be able to make something that fits inside one of our rockets or artillery shells. That certainly is a possibility. Hey, Sergeant, Dubois said, walking into the pavilion. Staff Sergeant Rickles says that they must bring all squad leaders and up for the brief of Company HQ. He say, what's up? Bradford asked, passing the staff back to Rin and quickly reassembling her rifle. Nope, but the whole FOB started buzzing like somebody kicked a damn hornet's nest. Word is, we're going on the offensive. About freaking time. Kowalski jumped up from his rack. Time to get some. Her rifle reassembled, Bradford slapped a magazine back and slung it over his shoulder. Get the squad packed up and ready to move, probably in a hurry up and wait, but let's be ready just in case. She headed for the door. Dubois help Ren make sure that he's got everything he might need packed up. Aye, Sergeant. Five minutes later, Bradford was joining the rest of the Echo Company squad leaders at the company HQ tent. With over thirty officers and NCOs packed between the two Humvees, spacing was tight. We got everyone here, Captain Spader asked, and got a confirming nod from Cartry, the company first sergeant. First off, congratulations on Sergeant Bradford and a promotion. It's well earned, and she has demonstrated it is well deserved while under fire yesterday. Saved all our rears. Damn fine work, Sergeant. Thank you, sir, Bradford nodded, as one of the other squad leaders patted her on the back. All right, everyone, listen up. While the brass goes about unfricking this cluster frick we found ourselves in, we're going to keep the pressure on the enemy. Those orders just came down straight from the top. He stepped aside to point a rough map set on the board for all of them to see. Recon ID'd a pair of enemy base camps at fifty clicks to the west, probably where that army that we wiped the floor with yesterday operated out of. Codename Blackstreet 1, he pointed at the circle, point slightly to the west, and then one further north and Backstreet too. They are likely defended, and we've had the window to get there before the survivors from yesterday do. General Langstam's been put in charge of the combatant commander here in Glala, and he wants to use the base captured, looted for intel, prisoners, and any gear that we can recover, then blow the frick up. Nods and mutters of approval ripple through the assembled marines. Two fives, the only infantry battalion that's managed to get their theater for the full strength yet, so, we're it. Orders are to gear up, load up, and muster at the landing strip for Tolkien in one hour. Wheels up in thirty after that. 
Echo Company is taking the lead in the assault on Backstreet 1. Foxtrot Company is taking the lead on Backstreet 2. Golf and weapons companies are being split to augment both. We're getting Halo and F-18 escorts from Miramar, and the Air Force flyboys are sending warthogs in close air support. Time is short, so additional briefings will happen en route. If you have questions, unless it's a showstopper, ask them now. The General has made this top priority mission, so we've been given temporary usage of every Humvee, truck, APC, and tricycle that can carry a Marine to get the battalion to Tolkien on time. Master at the ECP in 30 minutes. Radford, bring your diversity higher. Command wants an initial evaluation of Kishman performance under this. Dismissed. An hour later, Bradford was crammed into a Humvee with five very excited Marines and one increasingly nervous Kishman, as they rolled through the entry control point of M.O.P. Tolkien. Ahead, the portal yawned before them, roughly oval shape. It was four times as long as it was high. The clear, sunny San Diego sky visible through the portal was jarring against the low, overcast-turning vanilla skies of Gala. Clearly, marking the portal even without the pale green glow of the false wall that framed the edges of back. The Humvee rumbled and rattled along the packed and scraped dirt and gravel inside the MOB's expansion perimeter. Smack in the middle of the column of Humvees, trucks, APCs and government vans and SUVs racing towards the ash grip. Rows of Hueys and Ospreys were already idling on the field. The column bounced along with rough formed roads, weaving around temporary structures and not-so-temporary construction sites, and rolled right up to the airfield, clapping the random marine who had been thrown into their chauffeur on the shoulder as a thanks. She shoved the door open and stepped out. Dismount, devil dogs, let's move. Further up the line, Baracus was shouting encouragements as the marines streamed out of their vehicle columns, directing them to form up in front of the waiting aircraft. The rumbles and whines of the turbine and rotors filled the air alongside the stomping of boots and rattling of gear. The rest of the squad hopped out of the SUV behind them and half another squad. They rallied together and all nine marines and one Navy FMF corpsman and one Cashman artificer raced to fall into the designated position with the rest of the battalion. At the last of the marines tickled into the back of the formation, Baracus marched to the front of the battalion. He shouted, Attention! And the sound was nearly 800 marines, sailors, and one artificer snapping to attention thundered across the field. Michael strode onto the field before the assembled battalion. Winters at his side, Baracus snapped a crisp salute. Battalion assembled and awaiting orders, sir. Michaels and Winters returned the salute, and the battalion CO stepped forward. Marines, he shouted, straining his deep voice to be heard over the rumble of the aircraft. Yesterday, two five were the first Marines into this fight. Today, we're the first Marines to take this fight to the enemy. Our mission is to assault two enemy base camps fifty clicks west of FOP Williams. Capture every scrap of intel, equipment, and every prisoner we can, and then blow whatever the left is the frick up, before the remaining of the army we demolished yesterday can get back to use it. General Longstrom has decreed that if the Keeblers want to find a pillow to cry on after the beating that we gave them yesterday, they're going to have to walk all the way home to Mama, back in the Kleberville. Hoorah! Hoorah! Echoed eight hundred voices. Additionally, Intel reports that the Keeblers can use prisoners as living batteries for their damn mage towers. One, that's extra incentive to not get captured. Two, last night we found the remains of several hundred desiccated Kishman corpses in and around the ruins of those damn shield towers we knocked out. The poor bastards were nothing more but dried out skin and bones, sucked completely dry. Most of them stacked and discarded a cord wood. If they weren't already dead when those towers fell, they would have been dead soon after. Intel doesn't know how many prisoners they brought with them, or how many they left behind, but our mission is now includes the liberation and rescue of as many Kishman prisoners as we might find. So watch your targets. If it's got fur, it's probably friendly. If it looks like a damn Lord of the Rings cosplay, assume it's hostile and lighted the frick up. These are the same bad mother freckers who are in need of a whole hell of a lot of killing. Let's go give it to them. Your aircrafts have already been assigned by squad, fallout by company. Treat. 
Howl. Two five. Retreat. Howl. Semper Fi. Marines. Fall out. Echo Company. Mount up. Move, move, move. Get the lead out, Marines. Red gear. Get some. Radford sprinted forward following the calls of the 1st platoon and 2nd squad. She raced towards the open ramp of the V-22 offspray that would look like half of the 3rd Marine Air Wing's complement of AH-1Z Vipers and FA-18 Hornets thundered through the portal above them. Tyrell's night had been long and exhausting. He had skirted around the edge of the Kishman and human camp, staying well away from the harsh, unnatural lights and any patrols they may have. The human camp was not his target. The journey to the portal itself was exhausting. Without the ambient manor fields of the mage tower, it was left to subsist on manor that he could draw from either on his own, or the food that he brought with him. The forest he travelled through was young and unfamiliar to him. Wild and untrained, the trees had forgotten their masters and had no concern for him. Just as troubling was the constant stream of human troops and the camp at the portal. He wondered how the Keshman had managed to create such a thing, but was unconcerned. Answering the question was not his mission. Evading the Kishman patrols or what existed of them was child's play. More difficult was the human patrols and the strange machines. Ironically, the greatest challenges were the scattered Kishman who had yet to return to the army. They were everywhere. Many wandering aimlessly and weaving an unseen path through them proved to be the most difficult task. His reserves drained quickly, and he was forced to stop and rest several times. He foraged what he could and conserved his food stores. Twice he was almost found out when the Kishman nearly bumbled across him and rested. Finally, late afternoon on the day after the battle, he reached the human base camp around the portal. Its size and activity were alarming, and it was well defended and patrolled. Tyrell was prepared for this, however. Reaching into his bag, he pulled out a mana crystal, placing the crystal against the emerald mana gem that hit the end of his staff. He concentrated, weaving the spell constructed around him, though easier than within the range of a mage tower or with the support of other mages. The spell was still not difficult for him alone. The mana crystal came unbound, streaming into the gem of his staff, and Tyrell vanished. Getting over the human's defensive wall proved to be a minor challenge, but with the surge of mana through his blood and a boost of his acrobatics, and a few carefully placed shield flickers and served as stepping stones, he was across. The drain of his reserves was not insignificant, and he knew that he would need time to recuperate, but reaching his target must come first. Maintaining the invisible spell and the rapid bleed of mana, he raced across the human fortification, dodging tents, people, strange machines. He sprinted past and field with a large formation of humans standing before dozens of whirling contraptions, and nearly lost his concentration as dozens more were thundering, mechanical birds roared overhead. But by then he was slipping through the portal, setting foot onto another world. His reserves were waning critically low. He ran across the open field on the alien side of the portal. Another wall presented itself, and with desperately short surge of mana he danced over it, his energy failing as he threw himself across the cleared area to the side of the wall, past more humans and their strange constructions and vehicles. With the last of his reserves he stumbled down the embankment and into a small grove of trees that had never known an elven master. His reserves were depleted, and the spell failed, and he collapsed, victorious. End of chapter. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please consider subscribing. If you wish to support the author, there is a link to the original story, so pop over there and give him your support. If you wish to support this channel, however, there are a few ways to do so. The best and easiest would be to share this video with other people as well as liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All of these things tell the algorithm that this channel is at least vaguely interesting, and that may share it with other people. If you wish to support the channel in some other manner, watching my other videos would also help tremendously. Or, if you really, really, really like, there is a link down below to leave a tip, or to join the Patreon. Any and all support is very much appreciated. 
and I hope that you all have a good one until the next time, and I'll see you then. Cheers.